the senior NBA writer from Sports Illustrated, also boxing maven from DAZN. Our friend Chris Mannix is back here on the show. Good to see you, Chris. How good are you? Good to see you, Rich. I'm good. All right. So last year, you were the, the Lakers seer. Yes. You were seeing the Lakers go on a run that nobody else saw them potentially going on. And you, and you saw it deep into the like deep into the you know or, or early in the season i guess is what no stramatics right there. no stramatics <laughs> i like it we should make that gear no stramatics <laughs> um so you said you hadn't seen it yet yeah last night four in a row now without lebron two 19 point comebacks double overtime in milwaukee you, are you seeing anything yet what are you seeing you seeing something yet six and four without lebron is a remarkable number for the Lakers and last night's game was awesome, right? It was you know, fun, man. That was a great, it was a blast to watch. You know, I, I wouldn't blame a lot of people if they turned the game off at the end of the third quarter. Lakers were down, they go on a 27 14 run in the fourth to force the overtime. AD, great. Reeves made shots, Russell made threes. It, it, it was incredible to watch, and it was as much an indictment of what Milwaukee's doing as it was uh, praiseworthy for the Lakers. But I still can't get behind them like I did last year. You look at these last four games, and their defensive rating over the last four games is top three in the NBA. That's great. That's conference finals level. That's the Lakers of last year yes, sir. level. But if you look at the totality, say since the All-Star break, they're 26th in defensive efficiency since the All-Star break. That's not going to win you a first-round series. That might not even get you out of the play-in tournament. So I still can't predict which version of the Lakers is going to show up defensively because defensively is where it gets done in the playoffs. They didn't advance the conference finals last year because they had some electric offense. They advanced because they were elite defensively. If they can get back to that, they've got a shot at duplicating last year's success. If they can't, if they're more like the team we've seen for most of the season, they're going to have a hard time just getting into the postseason. Well, you, they kind of did it last night, right? I mean, I think the 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 score at the end of regulation was 101-101, which oh, sometimes is a third-quarter score. It, I mean, it was year. a fun game. Right. It was a brutal game in some ways, too. I mean, the Lakers got to think 11 points off their bench. I mean, AD had 30-something. Russell Reeves had a bunch. Spencer Dimmu was like one for eight from the floor. Like, it, it wasn't the most aesthetically pleasing game. Right. But that's the kind of game the Lakers have to win. They've got to grind out wins against these other upper tier teams. But I think we're out of the woods in terms of them somehow, like say Houston catching them, right? I mean, you're out no, of the I, woods now in yeah. terms of like they're they're we're gonna see them play in at the very least. I believe so. I think the biggest threat to to, to Houston's biggest opportunity is gonna be Golden State, right? Because right. the Warriors are not playing well. And Houston, remarkably, since Alperin Sangoon, you know, arguably their best player went right. down, has just taken off. Jalen Green's numbers since Sangoon went out have been off the charts. So because they play so well at home and because uh, Jalen Green is playing so well right now, you have to give the Rockets a decent chance of catching up to Golden State. Right. And then um, yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll talk about Golden State in yeah. a second, though. But I, I do want to pull on the string that you kind of left out there about this being as much of an indictment on what's going on with the Doc Rivers coached Milwaukee Bucks. What do you mean by that? Well, I mean, they've just been so uneven. Um they have had some great performances, some great stretches where they have played elite defense, and then they have had these stumbles where they're getting beat by teams they should beat, which includes the Lakers. I mean, that that's that's a game they should have won uh, last night. It, the consistency from the Bucks just isn't there. And I know Doc Rivers is doing everything he can to get them on the same page, especially defensively. I wrote about them in the magazine this month. I mean, they have pared down everything they're doing. They have simplified everything. What they do defensively, it's all one basic system. What they do offensively, whole bunch of pick and roll for Damian Lillard and Giannis Tendekumpo. So they are doing the right things, but it's so hard to get everybody on the same page when you introduce a new coach with new philosophies, at the midseason point of the year. So what we're seeing is not great for Milwaukee, but it's not all that surprising either. So by the end of the year, I guess you're saying, would 2020 hindsight, the Bucks should have hired Doc from jump? Is that what you're saying? I mean, yeah. I mean, if, with the benefit, there's a lot of things that went into the hiring of, course. of Adrian Griffin. Number one, we have to remember that Griff was a deserving 
coach to get that job. He had been an assistant coach for a number of years. He had been an assistant coach under Nick Nurse, who you know won a championship. I mean, Adrian Griffin paid his dues to get that job. And Giannis, when he met with him, was connected. There was a connection between Giannis and Griffin. That played a big role in that team hiring Griff. But when you look back at it, the idea of bringing in a coach with no resume, at least as a head coach, Mm -hmm. to run a team with a championship window that's really only three years wide, right? You've got Giannis, Dame, Chris Middleton. There's like a three-year championship window. They should have brought in a more established coach, a more accomplished coach. And even though Doc Rivers fizzled out in Philadelphia, didn't end well for him with the 76ers, he makes a lot more sense for Milwaukee, given where it is, than Adrian Griffin did. Chris Mannix here from Sports Illustrated on the Rich Eisen Show. What ails the Warriors, and is it fixable? (laughs) Shot making. It's the biggest problem right now um with Steph Curry on the team man. well I mean, you would never prob- say that about the, when Steph and Clay or- the problem isn't Steph um the problem is in the non-Steph Curry minutes mm-hmm. which have been problematic for the Lakers for a number of years but in those non-Steph Curry minutes they're not getting anybody to step up I mean look at that game they played uh against Minnesota mm-hmm. the other night where they had a lead going into the fourth quarter Steph goes out sits for a while because Steve Kerr didn't like playing him too many minutes after he played 35 in the previous game. They just got run over. You know, the, it went from, I think, a one-point lead to an eight-point hole they were in before Steph got back in the lineup. We know that Klay Thompson is not the player he used to be. He mm. has taken a step back. Age has caught up with him a little bit. Andrew Wiggins has been wildly inconsistent all season long. He's been a disappointment for that team. Kaminga's been good, but he's not ready to take on that type of responsibility. They just don't have consistent shot makers, bucket getters that you can rely on to score in the fourth quarter of games. And across the league, Rich, everybody's got them. Everybody's got two or three different guys that they can count on to make a shot. Even Minnesota with Carl Anthony Towns out has got bucket getters that they can go to, whether it is Edwards, Mike Conley. Those guys made shots against the Warriors in that game. The Warriors just don't have that extra option to go to when Steph is either off the floor or if defenses are loading up on him. So they don't, it's not fixable, what you're saying. I, I don't see it. I, I mean, they're, they're not on a good trajectory right now, and I don't see how with this current roster they're going to reverse that. Like, if you get them in the play-in, so many experienced guys there, anything can happen. But that play-in, like, the play-in tournament... It, right now, mm-hmm. looks like Adam Silver's fever dream, right? Like it's <laughs> because you've got right. the play in tournament Warriors and Lakers, Warriors, Lakers, yeah. Suns with yes. Kevin Durant in that mix. Like, like if you're Silver, and I'm just guessing that the NBA in the next uh, television deal is going to parse this out. It's going to say, like, the play in tournament is something separate. We're going to sell this to whomever. Uh, the year before they're doing that, if you get. Those three teams in that playing tournament, the rating is going to be through the roof, no matter what. Mm-hmm. So uh, th- this, you know, I'm sure the Lakers, Warriors, the Suns <laughs> want to be better. But for Adam Silver, right. this is exactly what they're looking for. Chris Mannix here on the Rich Eisen Show. So in the same way that the fact that Durant, Curry and LeBron and Anthony Davis and all those stars could be in the playing tournament. Uh, in the West being Adam Silver's fever dream, I guess the nightmare is the way most of us learn that uh, Michael Porter Jr. has a brother in the league this week, to be very honest. Um, so what is going on with Jonte Porter? What happened and what what is happening? Well, the right NBA, now? yeah, the NBA is investigating what happened. So to sum it up, what happened is there were some unusual betting being done on Jonte Porter prop bets, specifically two games, one in January and one just this past week where there was an unusual amount of betting on Jonte Porter's under numbers, under points, under rebounds, under three-pointers made. In both those games, Jonte Porter played but left the game early. In the January game, it was because of an alleged eye injury. In the March game, it was because of an illness. That immediately set up red flags uh, from both the gambling companies and within the NBA, which spends a lot of money to track this type of stuff. So the NBA is currently investigating that. Let me couch this by saying 
if it's true, right? We don't know if it's true yet. If this is all just an allegation right now. But if it's true, this is an existential threat to the NBA. This is the biggest threat to the integrity of the game since the Tim Donaghy scandal of 2007. Because you have a player who is allegedly manipulating the outcome of the game. Manipulating what is happening during the game. Now you can sit back and say, well, it's Jonte Porter. He plays 15 minutes a game. These things happen in the first half. What's the big deal? It doesn't matter. If you are intentionally manipulating how anything to do with the game, that is a threat to the NBA because first it's Jonte Porter, maybe down the line, it could be somewhere else. So how the NBA handles this is going to be closely monitored because this is a enormous threat to the integrity of the game. Well, exactly. Uh, because of perception as well. I mean, the NBA already has, because of Tim Donaghy, a major perception problem. And I think some of the players are are either playing into that to try and get the goat of some of the officials, right? What the, what the, the money sign was bit, given yeah. from. And then that's the NBA hate. That's why Rudy Gobert got slapped. The NBA considers suspending Rudy Gobert for that. Um, and they hit him with the biggest fine they could possibly hit him with. I think it was a hundred grand. For that, so the NBA is very cognizant and very aware of of how that is perceived by the public. That's why with Jonte Porter, if any of this is true, he's done. He, like done, I, I like think, you will never think, see him again. I think he will be banned from the NBA for life. And even if he wasn't rich, I've talked to a lot of NBA executives and coaches about this in yes. the last forty eight hours. Nobody's touching him. Like how, if any of it's true. How do you bring a guy like that into the locker room? How do you bring a guy that you all you might always be looking at funny if he goes one for six? Or if you put him in the game in an end of game situation, are you going to be a hundred percent certain that he's playing with the right intentions? It's it, I think it's if any of this is true, it's going to be impossible for Jonte Porter to ever play in the NBA again. And I'm sure the NBA has the same setup as the NFL, which is they're monitoring, they they speak to these um, I guess gambling sites all the time. They they monitor IP addresses. They they get the information from them, and you know, and it's it's kind of it's kind of wild. You're already seeing today, I believe, the the president of the NCAA, Charlie yeah. Baker, says he wants to remove prop betting from college sports entirely, because I mean, if an NBA player is deciding I can make some extra scratch doing this, or maybe more than what is salary is that's why i'm trying to even wonder what the I don't even finances know. His salary would be. john Tay porter's salary is four hundred fifteen thousand. a two-way player so it's not a, a super highly paid player though right. i think people listening would say four hundred fifteen thousand is pretty good money to play professional basketball right um the, the, the nba will tell you that their system worked right like they they monitor this stuff two games they figured it out and now they're investigating what happened and so the nba will tell you that the safeguards they have in place worked for a situation like this. But nobody knows if this is the only guy doing this stuff. Now, the questions the NBA are asking right now are asking the Toronto Raptors specifically are it's really just one question. Like, did Jonte Porter ask out of those games or did the team pull him out of those games? Because, you know, if the team pulled him, that's one thing. If Jonte Porter says, my eye is still injured, I can't play anymore, or I'm sick and I can't play anymore. That's a pretty damning uh, indictment of of what happened there. So I, we're going to learn a lot more in the next couple of games, but that's the question, or among the questions the NBA is asking right now, how is it that Jonte Porter came out of these games before his numbers could even approach the the overs on these prop bets. Yeah, and the two reasons why he got or he left those games, you can't have an MRI take a look at it. You know what I mean? It's just like, yeah, my eye's bothering me. I'm feeling sick. And Back those... injury would be another one. Little things that you can't right. can't do. But the thing, you know, th this is Adam Silver, as you know, Rich, embraced sports gambling before anybody did. In 2014, he wrote an op-ed for the New York Times saying we need to open the doors, legalize and regulate sports gambling he was at the forefront of all this when it comes to the four major sports and it's paid off exponentially for the nba i think they're going to rake in something like 167 million dollars this year in gambling revenue alone mm -hmm. this is the downside and we saw a little bit of a trickle of it earlier this month when you had tyrese halliburton say people are looking at me as a prop bet not as a player 
You had J.B. Bickerstaff. Yeah, what a quote this was. Saying that he is getting phone calls from angry gamblers who are upset over whatever happened during game. Now you have, allegedly, a player who has manipulated the game to win prop bets. This is, you saw the upside. The upside, the NBA's experience. You got FanDuel slapped on every broadcast. Every team regionally has a local gambling company that they work with in the stadium people in the, in stadium. the arena people are, are are betting you know in in arenas yeah i mean look if you can do it in any legal state you can do it in an arena pick up your phone and i'll be honest i do it like not not so much in basketball but like say hockey for example yes. i don't know anything about hockey right like but i like going to hockey games because they're a lot of fun sure if i have an opportunity in massachusetts to throw like 20 bucks on the Bruins outscoring the Capitals in the third period. Yeah. It's going to make my third period viewing. It's going to make it more fun. I, I, I get that part of it, but the NBA has got to figure out how to handle this better moving forward because they have fully embraced the sports gambling world. And this is the downside of it where you have Halliburton Bickerstaff and now the Porter situation, which nobody I talked to in the NBA uh, amongst teams believes is the end of it. Like this is not something that, all right, we, we did it happened. It's over. This could just be the tip of the iceberg for the NBA. Well, I mean, it's not just the NBA too. It's the sure. NFL. I mean, major league baseball right now is wondering what Shohei Otani was, was up to or what his interpreter was it's up to. It's crazy how this all is happening in one month period. Right. And, 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 and I'm sure you're, you're, you're seeing the conversation on, on, you know, their network on the DraftKings set. You know what I mean? Like everybody's in business with everybody. The same thing with the NFL. I mean, we we have, you know, the NFL has I think three different uh, official gambling partners, and 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 so player and and they the NFL relaxed the rules a little bit on what players are allowed to do on that front mm-hmm. in the last couple of well that of should change. Months. Like I know I, I was reading the Otani stuff. Like apparently players in baseball can bet on other sports. I don't think they can do that in the NBA. I don't think you can bet. I don't know for sure, but I don't think you right. can bet on everything or anything really in the NBA. But this Porter situation, I mean, I use the phrase existential threat because that's what it is. It, it's they're almost fortunate that it happened to a player the level of Jonte Porter, because I believe and again, this is just conjecture, but I believe they're going to make an example out of him. I believe that if this turns out to be true, they are going to come down on him mm. with the harshest possible punishment and hold him up as an example to say, look, if you do anything like this, this is what happens. The basketball death penalty happens. So if you do it, it better be worth it because if we catch you, you're done. A few minutes left here with Chris Mannix inside the Rich Eisen Show studio here. Okay, let's put your DAZN hat on and the boxing gloves on if you don't mind. You're not even going to do that. You're I not am. even, you know, this oh, is, gonna you're going to, I know where you're going with this. Okay. <laughs> We're seeing Mike Tyson videos, all right? Him working out, getting ready for Jake Paul. Crazy. And, you know, looks pretty good. You know, we have something called high register here on the Rich Eisen Show. You got to go high register to believe what you're saying, but I mean, he looks pretty good. Looks pretty good, Chris. What I is mean, the duration? Okay. Look at I mean, look at look, uh, look what we got going on here. What's the duration Moving? of these Instagram videos? <laughs> uh, 15, 20 seconds. Okay. 15, 20. You know, a fight is theoretically 24 minutes long if it's eight yeah. rounds. I sure. mean, I've seen plenty of Mike Tyson fights that were only 30 seconds. True. Sure. Uh, which good... decade did you see those in? <laughs> I'm just, I'm just not saying. this one. Not this, okay. one. Not this or one. Or the last one? Not, uh, or, no. or, or, or even the one before yeah. that? I'm just saying. Did you see that? Okay. I mean. Sure. Okay. Well, I mean, look at him. He's moving. He's he's gotten his. Uh, right. Netflix just loves you. I hey, don't Netflix. Get hit by that. Uh, Come on. I don't want to get hit by that. All right. So you have the floor, Chris. What do you think? Uh,. I stand by my prediction. This is going to be the most watched boxing yes. event in decades. Yes. That's for sure. Um, I don't believe Mike Tyson is going to win. I don't know what the rules are going to be yet. Nobody does. We're still in that weird gray area where the state of Texas not weighed in ah. on what the rules they're going to allow the rules to be. I would imagine they're not going to sanction this as a fight because Mike Tyson is seven and a half years away from being a senior citizen. Um, so I'm just going to... He does have his ARP card by now, I believe. I mean, yes, yes, he's... He's yeah, got that. He's Social Security is coming Mike's way in seven and a half years. <laughs> um, so I don't know what the rules are going to be. That being said, Mike Tyson's not beating Jake Paul. Like, he's not, he's not knocking him out based on 15 to 20 seconds of an Instagram video. Like, that's not <laughs> happening. 
He's just not doing it. So what are the rules that you think would be beneficial to Mike? Shorter rounds, okay. two-minute rounds, two minute rounds, I think would be beneficial, and okay. shorter total rounds. So if you were Mike Tyson, yes. your dream scenario is probably you got to go at least six rounds to make it worth it for the viewers because you don't want to do four two-minute rounds. That doesn't make any sense. But six rounds, two-minute rounds, uh, and as small of a glove as they'll legally let you wear. Because Mike Tyson, even at 58, has better one punch power than Jake Paul does. Oh, that, so. And that's that's Chris's point. That's yes. TJ's point. That's yes. our point. It's like yes. it's just I mean, the name of the game we used to play all the time was Mike Tyson punch out. Sir. Yes. You know, and that's the and same what Mike decade Tyson. Did, what decade did that come out? <laughs> okay. When I used to play video okay. games in an okay. arcade and I used to get um uh, credits for good grades. When I walked into said arcade with okay. my report card. Okay. So, so it, it, in that scenario. And I'm 54. If Jake Paul yes. stands there. Yes. And lets Mike Tyson wail away. I'm like, it's power slap. If he stands there <laughs> and lets him level him, then yes, Mike Tyson can win by knockout. If it is a five or six round fight, Jake Paul's going to win. And it could look kind of goofy in the process. When do we find, when does Texas have to weigh in on this? Sort of I, I don't know. I haven't, it's next on my to-do list is to okay. check in with, because Jake Paul's promotional company is running this. Mm -hmm. And as far as I know, Texas is not, they have not spoken to Texas and Texas has not advised them okay. on what kind of fight it's going to be. I know there's not going to be headgear. That was made clear to me at the very beginning. So that takes one, you know, the exhibition aspect of it kind of off the table. But what kind of machinations they try to make it as real as possible? I, I don't know the answer to that yet. I mean, just imagine when he's walking in, when Tyson walks in, you don't think there'll be a split second in your mind, Chris Mannix, of like, maybe. Like, it won't of course there your mind. will be, because okay. there could be 50,000 fans yes. in that building. Yeah. And the music will come down, the DMX song will come yes. on, and Tyson will probably walk it's out with that cutoff towel that he put around his neck. And of course, in that moment, yes. you will believe that you have been transported back to 1988, <laughs> and Mike Tyson is the guy that you remember. But yes. then, the bell will ring, 30 seconds will pass, and you'll remember that Social Security is coming Mike Tyson's no. way. Or he's going to walk out Left hook and it's over. Uh, Netflix loves you guys. Come I on. mean, you uh, you guys might as well put the show on Netflix that week. I mean, I mean this Chris, is, you know, yeah. nostalgia. You'll is be the Radio most, Row from nostalgia is uh, the most powerful from, drug, and we're snorting it like crazy. I right mean, now with it, Rich, isn't that training camps are open then? In what what day oh, is, is it? July? Again? No, maybe not. July twentieth. It's a week. July twentieth is week, week before. before. It's a perfect. Right. It's a perfect time. So It'll be can, just just as the post All Star break baseball is hitting. Oh, it's, they, they're um, smart like that. Yeah, and and training camps are just about to open. Like he, we'll be we'll be hungry for this. Take it a, like take it a step further. Yeah. Summer league is over at that point, so the NBA is completely off the grid. There you go. The oh. the the oh, signing period oh, for NBA. Man, There's man. almost nothing but regular season baseball yeah. going on that day. Uh, that yeah, that day. And you can. That's not a, a competitor for you if you're Netflix. And that's it. All you right. You should take the show. Let's take the show. I mean, it's well, the stay for not Cowboys training idea. camp when it opens up. I mean, well, it's at, actually that's out here in oh, California. It's, out here. it's right too. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah you know. A little hot in Texas. That's, it, that's fine. Well, well, we'll consider it. We'll we'll talk to Roku about this sort of thing. <laughs> can you bring a show for days? For a fight that might last for two minutes, <laughs> like what would be yes. what would be the ratio of show the minutes to event minutes? But think about like, think, uh, it, it would be crazy. Think be, about the like appetite. Two thousand and one. The appetite's going to be huge for it. Like the appetite already is huge for it. We're you guys, about it. you guys are frothing over here at the idea <laughs> of this fight I being. I am refreshing Mike's IG like all day. Just I want a new update. I want a new video. <sighs> He's like talking smack back. He's like day three. You want some of this? I'm like yes. I want yeah. all of it. <laughs> so does Jake Paul, I bet, too. I, for, be the I for the record, am not thrilled about this. What do you mean? It just it just doesn't sit right with me. The fact that there's a chance that Mike Mike Tyson could mm. lose to Jake Paul yeah, in a boxing match right. just doesn't sit well with me. And it's not like Mike's undefeated. He's lost before. Yeah, yeah well, yeah, yeah, but you lose <laughs> losing to Kevin McBride is different than losing to Jake Paul. Yeah. Like that's that to me. And I don't think it'll happen because even in the middle of this fight, 
if Jake realizes that he's just better, right? He's 27 years old. Like if Jake realizes that he can handle Mike, Jake's not going to try to knock out Mike Tyson. Like he's not, he's not Kevin McBride in Mike Tyson's last official fight was going for it. Like he's like, this is my chance for anybody to remember who I am. Right. So he went for it in that fight. Jake Paul, I don't believe is going to be out for blood against Mike Tyson. Just know this, Chris Mannix. <laughs> you're kind enough to say, you know, hey, I'm in L.A. Uh, let me know if you're if you're if you were uh, up for, you know, hanging out. Um, next time you do that, and next time you're, we're going to talk about this again. I have no doubt, Rich. <laughs> and I want updates. We want to know. We want to know what's as going on. As soon as I hear about the rules from the Texas Commission, you'll be There's, my first text. Yes. There you go. Thank you, Chris. I'll call Mannix. in. If it's between ah. 9 and 12 <laughs> Pacific time, I will call in. We will accept said call. Okay. Thank you so much. Chris Mannix here on the Rich Eisen Show. Great to see you. Thanks, you for, thanks for being here. Catch the Rich Eisen Show every single day on the Roku channel, 12 to 3 Eastern for free. 